I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to tell you, I love the Bible. I do. Not just, not just saying words to say religious words, but I love it. I believe it. I'll live by it, die by it, and die for it. And, um, you know, there's not, you know, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And for the glory, for the greater glory of God, I would gladly lay down my life for his word. I'd gladly be like John Wycliffe who against the express commandments of the Pope decided that people needed the Bible in the vulgar tongue, which was the word vulgar simply means what, how everybody speaks. Instead of the learned Latin language that the Bible was translated in by the Catholic Church and no one understood, you have to understand, when the Mass was said, Joe, you used to be a Catholic, right? Joe? You used to be Roman Catholic, right? Do you go back to a day when the Mass was said in all Latin? Okay. You used to be? Wow. So, uh, my mom taught me Pig Latin. Listen, my mom's cultured, man. Yes, she is. She's uh, North Little Rock High Society, tell you that. So, but anyway, but, yeah. Oh, she would agree with me. Uh, yeah, she is high cotton, man, I'm telling you. So, uh, but here is the mass being said in all Latin. And nobody, nobody knows what that means. Nobody does. And John Wycliffe saw the abuses of the Catholic priests over the people. Taking the widow's last cow to pray in indulgence for her dead husband. Leaving that family to starve to death. That's exactly what the Bible warns us about stealing widows' houses. So Wycliffe had his mind set on the idea that if he could just give people the Bible in a language that they understood, that it would set them free from that. That they would say to the priest, you can't take, you can't, I'm not bowing to you, I'm not praying to you, I'm not giving you my cow. And if my husband's in hell, he probably had it coming. Okay. And so that's what he did. And for that, he paid the price for it. Uh, it's one thing to be sentenced to death. But then it's another thing when they dig your bones up, burn what's left, and then take the ashes and scatter them out so that you have no final resting place. Yeah, I guess the idea was that God couldn't resurrect him. God don't need that. Amen? So anyway, that's... That's kind of how I see things now. When people walk away from the Bible, we're going to hang on to it or it's going to hang on to us. Amen. So Genesis chapter one, I appreciate you coming tonight. Let's uh, let's read day three again. Day three of the creation. In verse um, verse nine, which is three times three. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. So we have the heaven and verse 10, we have the earth and the sea. We have three things, the heaven, the earth and the sea. We're in Genesis chapter one, verse nine and 10. And then verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So 27 words there exactly. Three times three times three. This, this Bible, this Bible is in order. This Bible. So the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, 
whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So three things at the beginning of day three, the heaven, the earth, the sea, and then once God has raised the earth up, he, he put, I mean, think about it. God did not just plant the seeds and then waited, what, a couple thousand years for the forest to take over the earth? God placed them in place with age. This is what God did. When God created Adam, God did not create Adam this little baby or this embryo. He created a full-size man with age. So I think that, well, well, let's pray, but I think that how science is trying to measure the age of the earth, I think already they're getting it wrong because it appears that God has already created all of these trees and all these plants already fully grown. Already. So, Father in heaven, we do ask you to bless your word. Fill, fill our minds and our hearts with knowledge. With enough knowledge, Father, that will bless us, that we can use in our everyday life. And Lord, there's no doubt that as we learn your creation, God, you're filling us with knowledge and giving us understanding. And Father, there are things in life that we're going to face and deal with that we'll be able to draw from these things that we've learned. I have, not, I have no doubt because God, you've done it with me many times. So Father... Fill us with knowledge. Fill us with science from your word. Teach us the right way. And Father, we just marvel at your creation and what you did with your hands, what you spoke into existence with your word. And Father, just bless your people tonight. In this lesson, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. So this deals with the number three. So if we were to go to, uh, and here's what I learned. The, each day of the creation matches, let's go to Genesis 3. Because on day 3, God's create, God created fruit trees yielding fruit. So we noted in Genesis 2 that God planted two trees in the midst of the garden. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And again, it, it is obvious and apparent that God created them fully grown, fully matured, already with fruit on them, because God gave Adam the commandment of the tree of life you may freely eat. That fruit you may freely eat. Uh, by the way, just throw this in, just uh, how I didn't know this. Did anybody beside me know that acorns can be eaten for bread? Anybody know that? I didn't know that. I was watching a video about a native tribe that there's a process. Uh, just the meat out of acorns has a poison in it called tannin. And it's real bitter and we don't like it. It'll make us sick. But the Indians had a way of blanching that tannin out. They would take and crack open the nuts and take the meat out of the acorns and put them in cloth bags, set them in a creek. And the creek would wash all of that tannin out of that meat of the acorns. And then when they would take that, they would take it out and dry it and make, and make, you can make bread out of it. You can live on it. Never knew that. And the reason why I knew that was I was watching videos on Bigfoot and there was a story about a tribe that kept having their bags stolen. And so they watched one morning when this big eight and a half foot tall hairy man-like wild thing came and was stealing the bags of their acorn meat. And it's like saying, thank you for giving me this because I really like this. So anyway, that's how I found that out. But there was, there's actually recipes on YouTube for making acorn bread. So if we have to go run in the woods, we'll know how to live. Amen. All right. So, I mean, God made that for food. He made it for food. So Genesis chapter 2, God puts the two trees there, fully formed, fully functional, with age. Be amazing. Be amazing.
to cut these trees down now from the creation. To see the rings in there that God put in there. I just think that's neat. But anyway, that, that's like, did Adam have a belly button? I'm sure he did, and I'm sure he had all kinds of stuff in it, like we do. Amen. <laughs> okay? But anyway, so in Genesis chapter 3, we see the, the, we see the connection here that God has with this. The tree in the midst of the garden is, was Satan's focus. And both trees are referenced in Genesis 3. The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Because they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they are banished from the tree of life. And God has to set a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life. But anyway, you know, I've read this thousands of times. Genesis 3, verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And even in this, we have three things that Satan does against God's word. First thing is question it. Get you to doubt God's word. I've had that happen. I've had that happen. And I'm not above having it happen again. Okay? As as staunch as I am on this Bible and as committed I am to everything in it, there arise in my wicked, perverted, evil mind how maybe the Bible could be wrong. And that's normal. That's those imaginations that you cast down because they're against the knowledge of God. So anyway, uh, he attacks God's word by questioning it. Number one, yea, as God said. And then he says he contradicts God's word. God is, um, you shall not surely die. That's verse four. And then the third thing that he says is that he offers the alternative to God's word. For God doth know. That in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the three things Satan does. Uh, questioning God's word, contradict God's word, and then give an alternative to God's word. A secret doctrine that nobody else knows but Satan. Satan is the master of that. Every mystery religion, every, every other religion in the world, other than the religion of Bible believers is a mystery doctrine because there's a secret that cannot be revealed in there from the Bible. It must be gotten from an alternative source. So that's the point I was making in Sunday school this morning. So we have the tree and then we have in verse 6, look at what the woman, woman saw the tree was number one, good for food. Number two, pleasant to the eyes. Number three, tree to be desired to make one wise. So what is happening here? We, if, we, if we were to take this application of Day three, what God did on day three, what God is signifying with this day three, Satan sowed his seed in her. Now, some people carry this out and say that Satan mated with Eve. That's not biblical. It's not, that is not what he did. Some even take Genesis four verse one and somehow, some way, Satan ends up mating with Eve instead of Adam. In Genesis 4 verse 1. And I, I can read that 20 times and never get that out of there. Okay? So it's not there. It's not that he mated with her. It's that he poisoned her. He sowed corruptible seed in her. Causing her to doubt God's word. Causing her to contradict God's word. Causing her to select the alternative to God's word. And that's what God did. That's the, the message behind the, the third day of creation is the sowing of seed. So if we take this then, we already looked about the seed. The seed has three parts and we have three parts and God is three parts and all kinds of things display the Godhead because they have three parts. So there, there are three ways it can be done or whatever. Time is past, present, future. Matter is solid, liquid, gas. Uh, what else? Space is length, width, and depth. So in all of the creation, we can see the Godhead. But then we look at this idea of sowing seed, planting ideas in people's minds and in people's hearts. It is, number one, the way uh, lost people are condemned. Number two, it is also the exact same way that God's people are eternally saved because of sowing seed. 
When Satan sowed his words into Eve's mind, those three things that he did there, that caused her to want to sin. It brought out the desire of sin and he did not make her sin. But the fruit of the seed that he sowed in her mind was manifested. That's what I've been preaching. Last three Sundays was who you really are in your core is always going to be displayed in the fruit that you bear. Always. You can fool people for a while, but at some point it is going to be manifested. Amen. Uh, so turn to, well, I have up on the screen, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. So when it comes to a person being born again, uh, we look at day one. Day one is God gives them an awareness of the void of their life. So I use John for an example. And John, you know, I know enough about your testimony to know that this is what you went through. It's what I went through. But God created a void in your life. You were barren and empty and there was no form. There was no comeliness. There was nothing there. But God all of a sudden turned a light on. Click. God said, let there be light. And there was light. You know, with me, with this Bible, coming back to this Bible, that's, I, that's what I tell everybody. God said to me, Mike, let there be light. And there was light. All of a sudden now I know this thing. I can see it plainly and I don't question it. When you see, you can recognize light instantly. And that's how quick I surrendered to what God said. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, then, let's see, that was day one. Day two, God separates us from Him. He makes us aware that we're not God. He makes us fully aware that there is a large separation between God and us. And so we realize that we're not in good position with God. We're not in, you know, fellowship with God. We are separated as far as heaven is from earth. That's how far we are separated from God. Day three, then God sows the seed. He plants the word of God into our hearts and it will do what seed does. So first Corinthians 15, some man will say, verse 35, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Remember, there were groups of Jews who believed in the resurrection. There was a group that didn't believe. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees did not. They did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe in the miracles of the Old Testament. They were like the liberals of today. They thought that was all metaphorical and didn't really have an application. It had a philosophical idea behind it, but it wasn't real, wasn't tangible. And so Paul is addressing this to anybody who would say there's no resurrection. And if you read 1 Corinthians 15, the whole of what Paul is saying is, if there's no resurrection, what are we doing going to church? If there is, Chris, not something better for us, waiting for us on the other side, why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry? Three things. Why don't we just do that and just blow our time on this earth because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to unhook the train for a minute. I watched the other day Jeff Bezos. He's the guy that owns Amazon.com. One of the most wealthy men in the world. He's taking his money now. Jeff Bezos does not believe this Bible. If he did, he would be sending some of that money to me so we can feed people in Kenya. Amen. <laughs> but he doesn't. So he, here's what he's doing. He's taking his fortune, building rocket ships. Taking his fortune and building or designing right now Ways that humans can live in the heavens. And he made a point that said, we're planet chauvinists. In other words, as a species, we believe that in order to live somewhere else besides Earth, it has to be a planet. And he said, it doesn't have to be. We could build these rotating space stations that literally would be planet Earth up in the stars. We can build as many of them as we want to and people can live up there. And, I, and I'm grasping that. I see what he's getting. It is still the idea behind Genesis 11, let us make a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Jeff Bezos is committed to going in that direction. You know why? Because he doesn't believe in the resurrection. He does not have a savior. He does not have a God. 
And if he wants to hang out circling the earth for all of eternity, he's welcome to it. I'm going to heaven. Okay? So, that was pretty good. I'll hook the train back up now. Verse 35. Some man will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. We have to die. I don't like it. I hate death. We've buried some good people out of this church last several years. I hate it. But that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it, as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. So the point of this is on day three, God makes seed. What he's doing is he's showing us the resurrection. Seed goes into the ground. That shell corrupts off. It has to. Let it corrupt. You don't even have to embalm my body if you don't want to. If you don't save the money, dear, don't embalm me. So let me stink, okay? But I'll corrupt in the ground and I'll turn right back to the dirt that I came from. But out of that is the seed of the Word of God. I was with a family, it's been about 10 or so years ago, and an older couple and they lost an adult son. And they wanted to know if, you know, they could donate parts of his body for people to have his heart or his liver or his lungs or different things like that. So, you know, it could benefit somebody. And they said, and I didn't argue with them, but they said, no, we're going to keep him intact because he's going to need that for the resurrection. It's not the time and place to tell them God doesn't need that. Because God did not is not expecting to draw seed from the leftover parts of my body. What God is looking to do is resurrect that which he sowed into me, which is his word, just like a seed. Now I've told this story, that's how God let me bury my father, my granddaughter, was that I knew that I was not burying a dead person, covering them up. I was sowing a seed for the next life for both of them. And I was glad to do it. Okay, in a way. Sting of death still hurts, but I was glad to do it. Okay, so it's, it's all about that seed and resurrection. The number three, what day did Christ resurrect from? Third day. Third day I shall rise again. And so there's the connection there. So verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Of course God made you a sinner. Of course he did. So, it, so the seed of his word could be sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. Remember what I was teaching this morning in Sunday school. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be what? Done away. So, what part of this body do I need? I don't, don't need any of it and I don't want any of it. None of it works very well anymore. Amen? So, it is sown in corruption. Raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor. You have dishonored yourself before God. It is raised in glory. Sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. And it is raised a spiritual what? Body. Not a Casper the friendly ghost. Not some puff of wind somewhere. But it actually is a real body. Just of a higher form in a higher nature. I have not seen it. I can't tell you what it's going to look like. I just know that it's going to be a lot better than what you're looking at right now. Okay, there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. 
So Adam then gives us the body of our first life. Christ, because he's the seed of the word of, the God, of God, gives us the body of our second life. So how be it, verse 46, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And again, it's like the Old and New Testament. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. When that which is in part is done, then that which is perfect is going to come in. And that which is in part is going to be done away with. So, I mean, we have the Old Testament in our Bible, but we're not under that covenant anymore. And it's the same thing with why God give us this body first. And I, I mean, I always go back to how stupid does Joel Osteen have to be to write a book called Your Best Life Now? I don't get that guy. He said, by the way, that other family that was visiting with us gave, gave me some stack of booklets from John Osteen, Joel's daddy. And in those little books lie the seeds of Joel's apostasy. His daddy was a Southern Baptist preacher. Probably with a King James. Turned away from it, went charismatic, went crazy, sold that into his son, Joel, and Joel has taken it into full-blown apostasy. By telling you, going against 1 Corinthians 15 and telling you that your best life can be right here on this earth. I don't want it. So, verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And it's, but it's got to be in that order. You got to live this life first. Got to have the heartaches, got to have the toil, got to have the corruption. So the corruption can raise up in corruption. Luke 9, 22. Look, I mean, I just copied some verses where Jesus talked about, in fact, three times in the book of Luke. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. They shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again. He said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. He says it three times in the book of Luke, which is the Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel. I like that stuff. Now turn to Matthew 13. I've covered this many times before and in many ways, but I'm going to do it now in the context of the day three of creation and what God did. It's all about the seed. It's all about the seed. Matthew 13, uh, 24, another parable put he forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So if you were to hold your place there, let me stick my little marker there. And look at Genesis 3, or Genesis 1, I'm sorry. Look at the last three words of verse 12. The last three words of verse 12. What does it say? It was good. So, boy, we can't even fathom the perfection that this world was in when God first made it. it I, I really believe that even though everything was created with age, it would be like beholding a two-week-old baby with that brand new skin and the brand new hair that we like to feel, right? Brand new skin, brand new hair, brand new breath. That doesn't stink. Right? I mean, everything about that baby is just near perfect. And I think that's how the earth must have been when God first created it. Even though he created it with age, it's brand new. The, the devastating effects of the solar rays haven't corrupted it and hardened it yet. 
Everything is just soft and lush and beautiful. All right. So God said that it was good. So back in Matthew 13, that he sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, but while men slept, his enemy came. So we know then that, that this parable then is about the creation. And it's about what happens when someone is, is preached to. Or let's say a group of people is preached to. That as soon as, and you may, you may recognize this. Let's say that. Let's say that you're listening to me preach or Brother Cooley or Brother Reg or somebody online that you like. You're listening to them preach. And I mean, God's just giving you good stuff. And boy, you're going to go in that power. What's the, is the devil going to sit there and go, oh man, they're serving God now. What's he going to do, Johnny? Come after you. But what's he going to do? The point of this passage is he's going to try to sow tares in what God sowed in you. To get it corrupted, to get it choked out. He's always going to do that. Every, every good work of God. Satan always sows tares amongst it. I'm thinking of... Um, who was it that beheaded the king of England and took over as not the king of England, but you know who I'm talking about? Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell, there's no doubt this guy was a good guy. I mean, he was righteous and there's no doubt God blessed him. The king of England was very corrupt at that time. And because of the power of this book, Oliver Cromwell, God raised him up. And all of a sudden now he beheads, the, he, he's a member of parliament. He has a trial against King Richard, finds him guilty of treason against the people, has his head cut off, and Oliver Cromwell rules over England as Lord Protectorate. And England at that time, and you have to understand, he, was, he had raised an army in order to do this. And they were victorious in the battle. That's how we got to take over England. And England at the time was loaded with Puritan Bible doctrine and people who were reading the word of God and crying out to God. And there was revival everywhere. But it didn't last. Because once Oliver Cromwell died and his son took his place, the seeds of corruption had already been embedded and his son did not sit as Lord Protector for very long. And then all of a sudden now England has a king again. And so you see it in everything. You go through this Bible and look in every place. Every time God sows something good and does a good work, the devil is right along there putting in his two cents worth into it. Okay. And there's always wisdom in letting God deal with it because we know then uh, if we look in verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I've taught on that many times. Look in uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 26. I had that up on the screen, but turn your Bible there. Mark 4, verse 26. And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep. And rise night and day, and the seed should spring up, or should spring and grow up. And he knoweth not how. Because back then, they, they had no idea how that worked. They just knew that whatever, whatever plant they wanted was inside that seed. They didn't understand the mechanics of DNA like we do, but he, he, he knew that if he planted in the ground, and if it had plenty of rain, and that it was gonna, that seed shell was gonna corrupt off, and that meat was gonna come out. For, uh, notice the notice the pattern. For the ear bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, 
After that, the full corn in the year. Three things. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. I'll give you another illustration Jesus taught. He said the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is likened to a woman who hid three measures of, of, she hid leaven in three measures of meal. What is leaven in the Bible? Well, it's a type of false doctrine. Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. It's a type of sin uh, because it puffeth up. A type of pride because it puffeth up and so on. But it's a type of corruption because the leaven, the yeast goes in that, in that, uh, in that dough and eating the sugars that it finds in there. And then it releases this carbon dioxide. That's what gives you the air and the bread. That's the same process with wine or with beer or anything else. The fermentation process is that yeast is eating the sugar, the goodness out of that and, and turning it into alcohol, which is corruption. And so for every, and here's the point of this, for every good thing that God does, Satan has his alternative to it. Satan's alternative is always, number one, intoxicating, poisonous, and deadly. Always is. So beware of leaven. Beware of False doctrine. Beware of your own sins. Boy, wouldn't you like to get to, you know, John's been working this vineyard for how long? Okay. Do you have all of the weeds eliminated out of that vineyard? You're not doing your job. No, I've made that point also many times. God's not just going to do one work in us and we think that that's going to hold us until he comes. We're appointed to a task of making sure the leaven's out, purging the leaven, making sure whatever weeds we see pop up, nip it in the bud. It's a lot easier to bend down and pull those new weeds out that are soft, you can just pull them right out, here comes the root and everything. It's a lot easier to do that than waiting two weeks and you got to dig them out. It's a lot easier that way. But then if you don't do that, everything that God sowed into you is going to corrupt. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. And see how you answer it. There's people all around us that are good, I believe, good, good Christian people. Or they, they act in a manner that leads me to believe that they love the Lord. But they're reading these false Bibles. Now, we either believe it or we don't. But I, I get asked this question a lot. Can someone be saved reading and loading, being seated with these false Bibles, NIV, Message Bible? New American Standard Bible, things like that. Okay. Number one, we're not the judge. So God gives us some wisdom on dealing with this issue. He says, judge no man before the time. Now, if all of you people and all you people online would have heard me preach... 23, 24, 25, 26 years ago. You would have said, and, and known me then, you probably would have said, I'm not going to listen to that guy. Listen to him. He's talking about changing the Bible. He's giving Greek lessons every time. My wife will tell you, that's what I did. 
went to the Greek all the time, changed the Bible, changed the words in the Bible to some obscure meaning, and I did it on purpose. I deliberately did it. So had you known me then, you would not have chosen to be a follower of my ministry. No way, no how. But God changed me. Okay? God, God made the change in me necessary to do what it is that we're doing now as a church. So, when people ask me that question, I, I'm going to say to you in no uncertain terms, false Bibles do not save people. They don't. They are, if, if the seed is corrupt, the quote-unquote salvation is corrupt. And that's, that is an undeniable fact from the Bible. Over and over, he, not just in 1 Peter 1, he's telling us about, you know, good trees cannot bring forth evil fruit. Evil trees cannot bring forth good fruit. He's telling us that over and over. God distinctly put two different trees in the midst of the garden. And Adam and Eve chose one over the other. And it wasn't that God's, well, I'll save you anyway. They chose the corrupt tree and they chose corruption and that's what they got. It was disobedience to God. And so I, I am absolutely firm in this idea that, and all we have to do then is look, Chris, and some of you guys older than me, you guys go back in church long before me, you saw the corruption moving in with these different Bibles. Sterling, I know, saw it. He, he and I have talked about it. Chris, I don't know about you, but over the years, all of a sudden now churches are starting to turn corrupt. They're starting to allow sodomites in and, and allowing all kinds of things in and are not right. Okay? So, and it's because of the moving in of these false Bibles, they are corrupting the churches everywhere. Having said that, if God moved me out of corruption into incorruption. I don't think God's done yet. I don't think God is done snatching people. I mean, I, I hear from people. We hear from people. Call us. Send us emails. Come here and tell us. Man, before we started listening to you, we were out in the sea, man, and we were just adrift. We were going to this doctrine and we were going to that false thing. And we were in this cult and Man, we was reading out all these Bibles and we were saying Yahushua. We were doing all that stuff. And my only hope is that when these people say, we now stick with the King James, my only hope is that it was God that put that in them and not me. Because if I talked them into it, somebody else is going to talk them out of it. And I have seen that happen. I've seen it happen. And so my thing is, don't judge anybody yet on where they are with some of these Bibles. Okay? Uh, I will just, I'm not going to say much, but I recently have had somebody tell me, Pastor Mike, you are a man of God. And the words that you preach, they are dead on and I appreciate it. Now this same person still is not settled on this Bible issue. Okay? They're not settled on it. So, I think it's up to me and up to us, especially since you don't know who I'm talking about, to pray for these people and let this Bible do in us what this Bible does, and that is bring forth good fruit and then let God deal with them and let God make the change in them. Because that's, that's how he did it with me. It wasn't people calling me right and left. It wasn't people sending me letters and mails and telling me to watch this video and I'd better change or whatever. It wasn't anything like that. It was God leading me down the path to get to that point. And if God can do it with me, there isn't anybody God cannot do it with. So, but I, I'm going to stick with this. I believe that a corrupt Bible does not save anybody. 
It doesn't. Because it's an inheritance. And if all of a sudden you find out the child that you raised isn't your child, there can be no inheritance. Okay? It's that simple. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which, by the gospel, is preached unto you. The word and the gospel are linked together such that if it's a corrupted word, then it's a corrupt gospel. If it's an incorrupted word, it's an incorruptible gospel. Pray for those that you love and those that you know that are still on the other side of this issue. Don't try to beat them over the head with it because that won't work. It will not. I'm telling you it won't work. You pray for them and let God bring them to the light. And I promise you that's what's going to happen. So next Sunday night, you come prepared with your cosmology. You know what that means? Cosmology, J.R., Callie, you know what that means? Cosmology? Something with the cosmos. He's learning to parse words. He, I, he said, I heard the word cosmos in there, so it's going to have something to do with the space, right? So we're going to learn some cosmology next week. Not cosmetic. Cos, cosmetology, cosmology. Let's stand to our feet. Yeah. Teach you some, teach you to shine like stars next week. <laughs> Boy, I mean it. I mean it. You've got loved ones that are, are, they're drawn from a different vine. Pray for them, people. Okay? Father in heaven, thank you, God, for this time, best time of the week as far as I'm concerned. We study your word, talk about things, get into some knowledge and some science and understanding, Lord, of how you made everything and how you, how you did this over that and how, you know, how long ago it was. And Father, that's just, that is fascinating. But it is the foundation, God. Of who we are and what we believe. Father, my prayer is instill knowledge in the hearts of these people. Give them a good foundation, solid foundation, that they cannot be pulled away. They cannot be deceived. The very elect cannot be deceived. And Father, we ask God that you prepare us for days that are coming. We thank you, Lord, for the days that are already behind us. It's just one day closer to heaven. So bless your word tonight. Everywhere it goes, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.